I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, bitch. An open letter to Neil deGrasse Tyson. Well, I'm no Neil deGrasse Tyson, but I'm sure he's very busy. I hope you don't mind if I have a go at this. Dear Mr. Tyson, I am writing to you as a former man of science. Right, a former man of science, meaning you've abandoned your scientific career. And seemingly also the scientific method, which is a damn shame. I wonder what field you were in. Probably not anything related to physics, judging by the misconceptions you hold. But we'll get to that. But once looked up to you as an inspiring figure. You could say I was a fan. I watched all your lectures and television appearances. And I was struck by your ability to explain complex topics in cosmology and astrophysics in simple, concrete terms. Yeah, I agree with that. Mr. Tyson is a very charismatic and eloquent speaker. But we're not here to kiss his ass, so let's move on. Before we do though, I should point out, if it isn't obvious, that I've edited the original clip that I'm responding to. I've mostly cut it for speed, trying to keep the original context, but if you feel like I've misrepresented anything, I invite you to look at the original video, it will be linked in the description. However, your recent responses to queries regarding the Flat Earth can only be categorized as arrogant, childish and sneering. Deservedly so. But I'll try to be a bit better than Neil deGrasse Tyson then. I'll humor you. Let's explore this flat earth thing together, shall we? The earth isn't flat. I mean, dropping a microphone somehow proves gravity. This is called gravity. No, dropping the microphone was a punchline to a series of jokes. The Comedy Central logo should have tipped you off. He's not there presenting scientific arguments, he's doing a stand-up comedy routine. Yeah, there's a pretty big difference. Also, asking... At, at what, what point, point do you, do you stop, stop arguing, arguing things that have been settled for four, four centuries? centuries? Seems ridiculous to me, since nothing in science is ever settled. Everything in science exists as a theory that only stands until a better theory comes along that more closely matches observations. Yeah, you're right. Nothing in science is ever truly settled. However, there are theories which we can quite easily discard. Things like miasma causing disease. No, you know, we're fairly sure it's germs. And the four classical elements, they're not real. We have atomic theory now that superseded the classical elements. In the same way the flat earth has been superseded by the ball earth, or whatever you want to call it. It is important to re-examine the fundamentals of science, and there shouldn't ever be any dogma that you can't question. But that doesn't mean that every medical student has to worry about whether or not vitalism or the theory of miasma are true. No, they can simply operate under the assumption that germ theory is true, because it accurately reflects reality. And it has predictive power. They can effectively create medicines and vaccines and so on, using germ theory as their basis. Similarly, the spherical Earth model has a lot of predictive power. We've got GP GPS satellites, we got airplanes, we can predict weather patterns and shoot rockets into space and so on. The flat earth model simply has no predictive power and can therefore easily be discarded in favor of the model which more accurately reflects reality. Would you have told Einstein not to bother because Newton had already settled that gravity business 200 years earlier? I'm sorry sir, but you're going to have to do much better than that. I can do much better than that, with a better example. If Einstein had tried to resurrect Aristotelian physics, then Neil deGrasse would have been well within his rights to tell Einstein to go shove it. Cause that shit's been settled for ages, yo. My homeboy Newton figured that shit out. Ahem, <clears throat> I, uh, I apologize. The resurgence of the flat earth is not merely a handful of tinfoil hat wearing crazies who lack intelligence and teeth. You're right, there's way more than a handful of you. Nah, I'm just joshing. You're okay. This is a shift in consciousness by ordinary people who have started to re-examine the lies they were told as a child. So you're new atheists? Ooh, damn, I might have alienated some of the audience with that, but mm, still good. I'll keep it. Your job, sir, is to respectfully answer legitimate questions whether or not the answer supports the scientific model that you are a proponent of. No, it's not. Neil deGrasse Tyson is an entertainer. He's a science communicator, perhaps at best. He's not a research scientist. Besides, legitimate questions? Um, debatable? Traditionally, scientific progress has not solely come out of the scientific community, but from ordinary people with a different point of view. Such as? Some examples would be nice. The scientific method demands 
that you treat each point of view with respect, as it has the potential to overturn the existing model. Yeah, it does. But as soon as the hypothesis is falsified through observation or experimentation, you need to develop a new hypothesis. And if science refuses to even entertain alternative views, then it is no longer science, but a religion of scientism. Well, no, what you're describing would not be a religion. A group of people sharing the same unshakable beliefs or dogma doesn't create a religion. At minimum, a religion would also require behaviors and practices associated with that belief. And scientism is not a religion of science. It's more or less the belief that the scientific method is the best way of gaining knowledge. Perhaps even to the point where you believe it is the only way to gain knowledge. It has pretty negative connotations. So, I would like to ask you 12 questions and give you the opportunity to answer them respectfully using simple, easy to understand concrete terms that you are so famous for. Alright, I'll try my best. You've noticed by now that I'm showing quite a lot of Wikipedia. That's simply to establish what I'm talking about, in case you're curious and want to read more about the subject. Obviously Wikipedia is not an authoritative source, but it's a good place to start. Because I'm just an ordinary bloke, nowhere near as smart as you are. So, if you could give your answers using real, tangible terms, without complex mathematics, abstract concepts, or references to NASA or other data that I have no way of verifying for myself, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, of course, I'm pretty much a dummy myself. I won't be using any kind of fancy mathematics or big words or abstract concepts. I'll try to keep things very intuitive. Though, for a man of science like yourself, shouldn't you be able to keep up with mathematics? Regardless, I'll keep things simple. I'll keep things intuitive. Hopefully, by the end of this, you will have learned something. Question 1. Why is there land at the equator? So, you said that the Earth, Earth throughout, throughout its, its life, life, even when it formed, it was spinning, and it got a little wider at the equator than it does at the poles. So it's not actually a sphere, it's an it's oblate. And officially, officially it's an oblate, it's an oblate spheroid. And the bulges are at the equator. Alright, I'm with you so far. This is all true. So, which is easier to move? Rock or water? Alright, you're starting to lose me. I'm not sure I follow. Easier to move in what sense? If the gravity is strong enough to prevent the water from being flung off into space... Yeah, it is. It even holds the atmosphere in place, and the atmosphere is a lot less dense than water. Though density is kind of irrelevant in this case, because I'm not really sure what force would propel something off the Earth into space. Do you mean just the rotation itself? Well, yeah, gravity is the thing that's preventing that from happening. Then it's strong enough to hold the much denser rock in place. Mm, yeah, the rock isn't being flung into space either. So only the water should be bulging. Sorry? W wh what? How does that follow? The gravity is powerful enough to hold the water from being flung off the earth, and powerful enough to hold the rocks from being flung off the earth. Therefore, only the water should be affected by the rotation of the earth? What? You're also showing footage of tides, which is unrelated to the question at hand, other than the fact that, what, gravity can move water? I mean, the tidal bulge and the equatorial bulge are not the same thing, I hope that's absolutely clear. The moon's gravity wasn't what caused the Earth to become a squished ball, or an oblate spheroid. The moon's gravity is what causes tides, though. Just making sure you aren't getting these two mixed up. Uh, Alright, good. So, if the bulk of the Earth's water is at the equator, why is there land at the equator? That diagram is just very wrong and it relies on a faulty assumption that you haven't quite explained. Uh, rocky stuff that can't be ours to bulge? Why, because it's heavier than water and therefore more difficult to move? So if anything is going to move, then the water would move? But by that logic, shouldn't it only be the atmosphere that's bulging? Because the atmosphere is lighter than the water anyway? It doesn't really matter, it makes no difference. It's wrong either way. I think one of the biggest flaws with your reasoning here is that you think the Earth has a lot more water than it does. The Earth is almost entirely rock. It's just slightly wet on the surface. I think you're also imagining, like, rock. Like the thing you can go outside and pick up, it's hard, it's immobile. Remember, the Earth started out as a ball of basically molten lava. It was quite liquid, and there wasn't any water at that point. To make things a bit easier to understand, I put together a little animation. It's not very good, but try to follow along. 
Right, so the Earth is rotating around its own axis. It's just turning itself around and around. So we're looking at the Earth from the side. The North Pole is at the top, the South Pole is at the bottom. This is not a cross section. We're seeing the surface, not the middle. And it's rotating according to the arrow at the top left. Alright, hope you're following along so far. Any object we place on this ball is going to get accelerated in the direction of rotation. Basically, it will spin with the Earth. It's important to note, however, the further away an object is from the equator, the less acceleration it will receive. This is simply because an object at the equator, where the Earth is thickest, has to travel a lot further, and therefore faster, to make a full rotation than an object that is placed closer to the poles. On top of this, every object is being pulled towards the center of the Earth by gravity. Assuming that the objects have the same mass, and they are the same distance away from the center of gravity, they will be pulled with the same strength, the same force. An object near the poles will be pulled towards the center of the Earth by gravity, at the same time Earth's rotation will push it outwards, very slightly. Which means that the object will want to move diagonally towards the equator. And this is of course true for both poles. It's a lot more complicated than that, and of course this is happening in 3D space, but remember, we're keeping it very simple and intuitive. Hopefully you're following along. An object that's at the equator is being pulled in by gravity and pushed out by the Earth's rotation. If the rotation is strong enough to overcome gravity, the object is going to start moving outwards. So if we replace objects with points on the Earth and just repeat this process, it looks something like this. Yeah, it's very shoddy. Here's a nicer version of what's happening. Now this is hugely exaggerated. The Earth is nowhere near as egg-shaped as this. And eventually the strength of rotation and the strength of gravity reach an equilibrium, and that's how Earth got its shape. An oblate spheroid. I think. I might be very wrong about all of this. As I said at the start, I'm pretty much a dummy. I'm not a smart man, I'm not a man of science. If you spot any mistakes I've made, please go ahead and point them out. All right, back to the video. Let's just wrap this question up. So if the bulk of the Earth's water is at the equator... Right, so that's wrong. That assumption is not correct. Therefore, the rest of your questions make no sense. Why is there land at the equator? There's land at the equator because of the shape of the continents. There is not a big bulge of water covering the equator. And please don't say it's because of the height of the land. Well, I mean, technically it is. It's because the land is sticking out of the water in those places. You're just assuming that it needs to stick up massively far because there's so much extra water at the equator. Which again, is wrong. Remember, there's more stuff at the equator. There's more rock, there's more land there. So it makes perfect sense for there to be land at the equator. Most of Africa is flat plain, sometimes under sea level. In fact, the Danakil Desert in northeast Ethiopia is said to be the lowest place on Earth. And, incidentally, one of the flattest places on Earth, too. Yeah, that's true. Though it's surrounded by ground that's elevated higher. Otherwise, it would be part of the ocean. But yeah, this has no real bearing on anything because your original point is just mistaken. Alright, that's the first out of 12 questions answered then. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed. This was the first time I tried doing any kind of animation. Obviously it's quite bad, but hopefully it gets my point across. I might be wrong about many of the things I say, so if you spot any mistakes, go ahead and point them out and I'll issue some corrections later on. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see y'all next time.